Hi ladies and gentlemen, today's lecture is going to be about introduction to immunology and immunopathology. It's going to be presented by myself, Stephen K, the resilient guy, and this lecture comes to you courtesy of the Immune System Explainer, our main website, immunostudies.com, whose address I'm going to be giving at the tail end of this lecture. So the lesson outline is that uh, we shall be looking at definition of select terms. We shall look at analogy of the immune system. There is a very important analogy of the immune system that I'm going to be demonstrating. Uh, we shall talk about types of immunity, differences between innate and adaptive immunity, overview of the immune cells, tissues and organs of the immune system. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, look at definition of terms. And the first term is immunology, which is the study of the immune system. Uh, immunology is a science uh, that deals with studying the immune system. What about the immune system? The immune system is a network of immune molecules, cells and tissues as well as organs of the immune system that protect against foreign antigens. Against foreign antigens. Then another term is immune response. What is immune response? This is a collective coordinated response to foreign bodies. Another term, ladies and gentlemen, is the term immunity. And this term uh, means the state of protection or state of resistance of your body against or from foreign bodies. And these foreign bodies would include bacteria, viruses, tumor antigens, so on and so forth. Another term is immunogen, and immunogen is a molecule that can induce an immune response in the body. A molecule that can induce an immune response in the body. Immunogen is different from antigen, and an antigen, which sometimes uh, is uh, used interchangeably with the term immunogen, is a molecule that can specifically react with products of an immune response. And these products could be antibodies. So what happens is that an immunogen is not necessarily, or rather an antigen is not necessarily an immunogen. And there is um, an argument among scientists that uh, all immunogens are antigenic, but not all antigens are immunogenic. What does that mean? What that means is that uh, there are some antigens that are not immunogenic, meaning that they cannot be able to induce an immune response in the body. They can't be able to, to induce an immune response in the body. Okay. Then we have the term hapten. Hapten is a molecule that cannot mount an immune response unless such a molecule is conjugated to an immunogenic carrier molecule. For the most part, this carrier molecule is a protein. It is a protein molecule. So this is a big molecule, and then um, the hapten, which is a small molecule, is conjugated to the carrier molecule, okay, covalently bound, and then they become the two of them become a big thing that can be seen, seen in quotes by the immune system to be able to mount an immune response. 
Now, the interesting thing, ladies and gentlemen, about Hapton is that once an immune response has been mounted, the immune system is going to produce antibodies against both the carrier and the Hapton separately. And the good thing is that those antibodies can now be able to engage Hapton away from the carrier molecule and the anti-carrier antigen the antibodies can also be able to engage the carrier molecule in a separate manner so uh, haptens cannot be able to mount an immune response unless coupled or conjugated to an immunogenic carrier and uh, that way they become immunogenic so we conclude that haptens are not immunogenic but when coupled or conjugated to a carrier molecule they're going to become immunogenic okay then uh, and uh, examples of aptens are actually uh, a couple of viruses we have a number of viruses that are too small too small actually the size we're talking about here is below 600 daltons and so they cannot be um, seen by the immune system they can't be able to mount an immune response but when coupled to a carrier molecule they can be able to do that the other term that is quite important as well here is the term epitope the term epitope is synonymously called antigenic determinant and this is the part of the antigen that combine with antibodies okay Combined with the antibodies, and the part of the antibodies that combines with epitope is called paratope. paratope. So epitope is an antigenic determinant. You may want to call it the active part of uh, the active part of the antigen, or the active part of an antigen that is able to bind specifically to the paratope of an antibody. Uh, you know, uh, as a product of an immune response. The other term, ladies and gentlemen, is the term antibody. The term antibody is sometimes uh, used interchangeably with the term immunoglobulin. And uh, an immunoglobulin is a molecule that combines with an antigen to form an immune complex. An immune complex is illustrated by this box bracket here, uh, the sign for antigen and then the sign for antibodies. So whenever you say antigen and hyphen antibody and then the box bracket here, we're actually referring to an immune complex. So an antibody is an immunoglobulin, uh, which is a molecule that combines with an antigen to form an immune complex. Uh, remember, uh, we call them antibodies when they are mounted by the body in response to a challenge by a foreign body but immunoglobulins are the same antibodies but perhaps before the challenge when they exist in the blood serum as proteins as proteins then we can refer to them as immunoglobulins this is going to become clearer ladies and gentlemen when we go to the topic of immunoglobulin structure in the past, in, in, in the coming days now we have uh, the other term is uh, cytokines Cytokines is a group of signaling molecules. Um, these are proteins that um, help the cells to communicate with each other. So the cells can be able to communicate with each other by way of uh, cytokines, which are proteins that circulate around uh, blood circulation. Cytokines are very, very important. Uh, an example of a cytokine are interleukins and these are a group of cytokines that are first expressed in leukocytes and that's why they are called interleukins inter meaning between and then leukins meaning white blood cells so there are molecules that came between the white blood cells to be able to help them communicate with each other so the term interleukins is derived from uh, you know the behavior 
of the cytokines and uh, we have quite a number of them that fall into this category of cytokines, the interleukins. They are produced by activated T lymphocytes. Of course, you know, uh, the T lymphocytes are activated by antigen presenting cells, including the B cells, the macrophages, the dendritic cells. But we're going to have this topic in the coming days uh, to demonstrate that the T lymphocytes cannot be able to identify or bind to any antigen unless such an antigen is presented to it by the antigen presenting cells of course in the context of major histocompatibility complex we shall be talking about this in the coming days now we have three subsets of T lymphocytes that produce cytokines we have TH1 cells we have TH2, we have TH17, TH referring to T helper, T helper cells, because the CD4 positive T lymphocytes are also referred to as T helper cells. So we have T helper 1 subset, we have T helper 2 subset, and we have the T helper 17. Um, if I was to just give some examples of cytokines produced by TH1, uh, lymphocytes, they include interleukin um, 2, interleukin uh, 12, uh, interferon gamma, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and tumor necrosis factor beta, interleukin 8 as well, and interleukin 6. TH2 can produce interleukin 4, interleukin 5, interleukin 10, and interleukin 13 and TH17 produces only one type of cytokine which is uh, interleukin 17. This topic is going to become clearer when we in future talk about activation of the uh, T cells, clonal um, expansion of the T cells and what they do once they are activated which is to produce cytokines. The other term that is very important which is very important is a complement system and uh, the complement system is biochemical cascade of the immune system they are called proenzymes they are usually uh, around 20 proteins circulating these proteins are encoded in the germline and uh, they circulate within the, uh, the, the the blood circulation and what happens is that this um, these proteins can be activated by way of cleavage. Uh, one activated cleaves the next one, and then the, the next one cleaves the next one. Every time there is activation, there is cleavage into two parts or two fragments of every protein. And uh, in the long run, we have an amplifying effect of a cascade, the cascade, the biochemical cascade that we're talking about here. And then the um, uh, activation leads to formation of what we call membrane attack complex. And this leads to disruption of the integrity of the organism's plasma membrane and then can lead to uh, lysis of such uh, plasma membrane. The um, is inflammation. And uh, inflammation is an immune response that involves exit of your immune cells from the blood to the site of injury. This exit is called extravasation. This exit of the immune cells from the vascular space to go to the site of injury is called extravasation. And these uh, activities are marked by what we call cardinal signs. And the cardinal signs include redness, heat, swelling, and sometimes you have the fifth cardinal sign, uh, which is called laws of function or functional iso. In uh, Latin, if we have uh, inflammation proceeding to become chronic inflammation. So, ladies and gentlemen, what happens here is that um, the cells are going to exit the blood vessel. They'll go to the site of injury or site of infection they're going to deliver uh, the activities right there. If uh, those cells are neutrophils, for example, which are usually the first ones to exit, 
they're going to start phagocytosing the microorganism at the site of injury. Okay. Uh, then um, the term is immunopathology. That is also a very important term. And immunopathology refers to diseases that arise from defective immune response. Uh, and uh, the immune responses that we're talking about here are innate and adaptive immune responses. Uh, these include hypersensitivity, autoimmunity, immunodeficiency, transplant, rejection reactions, uh, sometimes um, uh, you know tumor immune response or immune response against the tumor antigens. All these are abnormalities of the immune system. It is when the immune system is inappropriately mounting an immune response that is not helpful, that is not protective to you. And so that kind of an immune response is called immunopathology, right? It is called immunopathology. Now, friends, ladies and gentlemen, this is the analogy that I've been promising from the previous lecture and even at the beginning of this lecture that um, um, your immune system compares to your dog at home and what I've done to bring uh, this to a lot of clarity is to compare them into columns on the left hand side we have the immune system and uh, your dog at home on the right hand side of this uh, slide so uh, firstly your immune system protects self antigens and attacks foreign antigens. So it protects your own cells, attacks foreign antigens like microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, protozoa helminths, my, uh, I mean uh, fungi, so on and so forth. And then your dog at home protects you and your people at home and attacks visitors. Anyone who comes from outside is going to be attacked, but uh, your people back home are not going to be attacked. The immune system can get mad and it can attack self antigens and uh, if that happens then uh, what uh, will have emanated is actually autoimmunity and that means the immune system will have lost its regulatory ability. Uh, your dog uh, back home can get mad when infected with rabies virus and in such circumstances it is not going to protect you but rather attack you and your people uh, the immune system can develop tolerance it can get used to some antigens like uh, in the cases of hypersensitivity the immune system can get used to some um, antigens and then after some time you no longer will have hypersensitivity reactions will no longer have an exaggerated immune response that causes damage your dog back home can also develop tolerance. It also can get used to a visitor, a person, maybe a new worker, uh, a new house girl back home. Uh, uh, the dog is going to get used to that uh, person and then it will no longer attack that person. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, that is how your immune system compares to your dog at home. I hope this makes sense to you. Thank you. I wish to introduce you to types of immunity, just a mention because we're going to do uh, the nitty-gritty nitty or further uh, uh, details about these uh, two arms of the immune system later. But um, uh, the two types of immunity, we have innate immunity. Innate immunity is also called natural immunity. It is also called non-specific immunity. So ladies and gentlemen, I would wish you to note that um, there are three synonymous names for this arm of the immune system. You can call it innate, you can call it natural immunity, you can call it non-specific immunity. And this is uh, the natural immunity whose cells are encoded in the germline. They're inherited. This immune system is very fast it is very rapid in responding to a foreign antigen because of this fact that the cells are encoded in the germline. Uh, this is a departure from the adaptive immunity whose cells uh, have to be rearranged in response. They have to adapt 
to a foreign attacker for them to be able to respond adequately. So the innate immunity uh, is first, it is natural, it is non-specific. Uh, the other arm of the immune system in broad categorization or classification of the immune system is the adaptive. The adaptive immunity is also referred to as acquired immunity and it is also called non-specific, uh, sorry, it is also called specific immunity. So this develops uh, from B cells and T cells after an encounter with an antigen. The adaptive immunity, ladies and gentlemen, is divided into arms, the humoral and the cell-mediated arms of the adaptive immunity. The humoral is mediated by the B cells, while the cell-mediated branch is mediated by the T cells. That is CD4 positive T cells and the CD8 positive T cells. We shall go to the details of these two arms of the immune system in future and uh, you'll get to learn more about them. Differences between innate and adaptive. I've put this, uh, you, I mean, I've, I've, I've talked about this using the same color across so that uh, it's easier for you to compare one difference to the other difference because that is the only way the differences can make sense. If you talk about a list of differences or a, a, rather a list of features of the net separately and then a list of adaptive immunity separately, that is not going to be helpful in terms of differentiating the two branches of the immune system. So it's important that you talk about them across like this. So the first difference is that, um, and we've already mentioned that, that uh, um, the innate immunity is general and non-specific, while the adaptive immunity is specific. So it is narrow in terms of response and therefore it does not miss its target. It, um, um, uh, it is very specific and of course in future we shall be talking about this specificity that we are talking about here refers to the specificity of the T-cell receptors and the B-cell receptors on the B-cells. The T-cell receptors on the T-lymphocytes and the B-cell receptors on the B-lymphocytes. The other difference that is important is that um, the cells of the innate immunity are encoded in the germline. So you have them at birth, you inherit them from your parents. At the same time, or rather in a different way, the adaptive immunity cells are acquired after antigens. So usually we have uh, a pool of uh, not very specific um, T cells and B cells, and then once we have the exposure of the body to an antigen, then they can learn, they can adapt to the new situation, and then they're going to take some time to clonally expand, to become activated and then clonally expand. So uh, for that reason, that sends us to the third difference, where we say that innate is rapid. Why? Because the cells are ready to respond. And then the adaptive is slow. Why? Because the cells must take time to learn using their receptors. The B cells using the B cell receptors, the T cells using the T cell receptors. They take time to learn about the new antigen and therefore they're going to take time. And so we make a conclusion that they're slow in terms of response compared to uh, the net, okay? Another very important difference, ladies and gentlemen, is this one on memory. The net immunity, despite the advantage of being rapid, has got a disadvantage of the fact that it does not keep memory of anything that it has encountered. So it does not remember anything that it has encountered. Uh, the adaptive immunity keeps memory of everything it encounters. 
this is a very important feature this is the feature that has been exploited by the scientists the immunologists and other scientists to come up with a concept of vaccination because vaccination as we shall see in future is about preparing the immune system exposing the immune system to some antigen to prepare the immune system to be able to encounter same antigens when they come by in future so the concept that is exploited to come up with vaccines and the concept of immunization ladies and gentlemen is the feature of memory the fact that the adaptive immunity has got memory is what is exploited or what was exploited by earlier scientists like um, the father of vaccination uh, Edward Jenner in the year 1798 to be able to come up with vaccines and we shall talk about vaccines and the types of vaccines in a future lesson uh, last but not least ladies and gentlemen is that uh, the net immunity has the following cells being involved and there are quite a number the neutrophils belong to the innate immunity eosinophils basophils the three of them are collectively called polymorphonuclear uh, granulocytes uh, then the monocytes are also involved in innate immune response the macrophages and dendritic cells both of who which are descendants of the uh, uh, the monocytes the natural killer cells is also part of the cellular uh, components of the innate immune system on this other end ladies and gentlemen the cells involved in adaptive immune response include the b cells also referred to as b lymphocytes and the t cells also referred to as t lymphocytes okay So these differences are very important. Sometimes we can talk about them as being advantages and disadvantages of one arm of the immune system compared to the other arm. And uh, you can see the differences and the advantages are obvious. If you want to talk about disadvantages, they're obvious from this list. Because when you talk about specificity, non-specificity, then that looks like a disadvantage on the part of the innate immunity an advantage on the part of the uh, specific immunity when you talk about the the, the, the cells of the Im, uh, innate immunity are encoded in the germline that looks like an advantage for the innate and not an advantage for the adaptive when you talk about the fact that innate immunity responds in a rapid manner that is an obvious ad an advantage to the innate compared or relative to the uh, adaptive immunity when you talk about the net not having memory, it's an obvious disadvantage and an obvious advantage on the part of the adaptive immunity, the fact that it has memory. And um, so um, that discussion can also be discussed in a manner of uh, advantages or disadvantages. You also can talk about them as being features of the different arms of the immune system. But here, We've talked about them as being differences between innate and adaptive immunity. The other very important part of this introductory lecture to immunology and immunopathology, ladies and gentlemen, is about um, is about um, uh, the cells, the cells of the immune system. And again, we just mentioned them. We had mentioned them uh, uh, in the previous slide where, where we talked about the innate and uh, the adaptive immunity differences. So when you talk about the cells of the innate immune system, we're talking about um, <coughs> mononuclear phagocytic cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, the monocytes, all of them have a single nucleus and so we call them mononuclear um, cells of the innate immune system <clears throat> then we have some more cells 
we have natural killer cells, sometimes loosely referred to as lymphocytes of the innate immune system because they belong to the innate immune system, yet they are actually lymphocytes even in way of appearance. Then we have uh, mast cells, they are very important during allergic reactions or hypersensitivity reactions, particularly um, the, the type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. We are going to talk about that in future. Um, the basophils, the sinophils, the neutrophils all belong to the innate immune system, collectively referred to as granulocytes and sometimes called polymorphonuclear cells. As I had uh, earlier said, uh, sorry, before we go to the adaptive, we also have the gamma delta T cells. They are also believed to belong to the innate immune system, and I've already said the natural killer cell uh, or the natural killer T cells. Then uh, we have the adaptive immunity has only two types of cells: the B cells, which are the cells that usually produce antibodies. In fact, I must say they are the only cells that produce antibodies in the body. And then we have the T cells, which include the CD4 positive T cells and the CD8 positive T cells. The CD4 positive T cells are also called T helper cells, but we also have a subset of CD4 positive cells called T regulatory cells, which are also identified by two additional markers, CD25 which is also called interleukin-2 receptor and uh, the FOXP3 marker. And then we have the T helper cells, which are <coughs> also CD4 positive. The CD8 positive T cells, ladies and gentlemen, are also called cytotoxic T cells. They are called cytotoxic T cells because they kill by way of using their cytotoxic granules. Now, overview of the immune tissues overview of the immune tissues and organs first of all we have primary lymphoid organs we also call them central lymphoid organs and uh, this include the bone marrow and the thymus these organs ladies and gentlemen are very important when it comes to nurturing the blood cells the B cells is a site where nearly all blood cells originate from. However, there are some that will originate from the bone marrow and then proceed to some other sites to mature and um, be released to the peripheral circulation as mature cells. A perfect example of these are the T cells which usually migrate to the thymus. Um, a thymus which is located somewhere mediastinum uh, of your body okay uh, or at the mid-stinum uh, site location of your body and uh, the thymus is a very important site for nurturing the thymocytes nurturing the T cells and training them we are going to have a lesson about what happens within the thymus in future so uh, stay tuned and you're going to have that in, uh, in future as well. Then uh, we have uh, the secondary lymphoid organs. They're also referred to as peripheral lymphoid organs. And this, this uh, ladies and gentlemen, include the spleen. Uh, that is very important in uh, activation of the B cells where we have germinal centers where the, T cell, the, the B cells are activated in we are also going to have a lecture on this in future uh, uh, then we have lymph nodes lymph nodes are spread all over your body we shall have a look at them in the coming days uh, we have them uh, we, we have the tonsils we have uh, the axillary lymph nodes we have inguinal lymph nodes so on and so forth we also have uh, another set of uh, secondary lymphoid organs, which are the mucosal associated lymphoid tissues, uh, popularly known as MALT. These are found, uh, you know, uh, particularly within the mucosal regions or the 
the mucosa tissues uh, around the gut that's where we find this kind of um, lymphoid tissues and they're very important because they confer protection around those areas by way of subscribing to the YouTube channel and also being able to subscribe to the uh, immunostudies.com the immune system explainer site and then you can be getting all that we put across there for your benefit thank you thank you thank you very much